So my name is Kevin Goldsmith. I am a uh, VP of engineering at Spotify. That's, uh, I am what we call an alliance lead, which means uh, I manage tribe leads, if you know any of our weird uh, terms for teams. Um, I'm going to talk about microservices at Spotify. I'm not going to go, I'm going to talk about lots of different aspects about it, a lot of why we use them, um, some detail, but I'm not going to go too deep in this. But I can take some questions around it. So I'm going to start this discussion with a bit of a hypothetical thought experiment. Let's say I wanted to build a large application. Now, this application is going to have some requirements, right? There's some stuff this application has to be able to do. It has to scale to millions of users. It has to be internet scale. Uh, it has to uh, support multiple platforms, right? So it has to work not only on your mobile and on your web, but also on desktop and on embedded devices, on game uh, platforms, lamps it has to run on. Uh, it has to handle some very complicated business rules. This is not a simple application. This is a very, very complicated application with lots of really strange business rules not set by you, set by others. And it has to be competitive in a fast-moving market. Now, there's two ways to be competitive, or there's two parts of being competitive. Number one is you have to be able to respond quickly when your competitors make a move, right? So you have to be very nimble and very responsive. Better than being able to be reactive, it's better to be proactive and to be the ones that everyone is chasing, right? So ideally, you want everybody chasing you. You don't want to be trying to play catch up to everyone else. So you need to be able to innovate really quickly. Now, this is a thought experiment, but it's a pretty stupid thought experiment because I'm obviously talking about a product, a product like this, Spotify, right? This is the, this is the product I'm talking about. Now, what those, those requirements for our, our product mean for us, there's a few things. One, today, and I'm using published numbers. Uh, the real numbers are higher in all cases. Uh, 75 million monthly active users. An important thing to know about what we think an active user is compared to somebody like Facebook. Uh, Facebook, you use Facebook several times a day for a few minutes at a time. You use it while you're standing in line at the bank. You use it you know, while you're on the bus. People use Spotify for hours at a time. Um, I think, I don't have the right numbers off the top of my head for just general length of session, but I can tell you the way that our editorial team measures average session length uh, for their playlists is like 23 minutes is their average session length. That's part of usually like a several hour session. People listen to us all day long. People put on white noise and sleep with Spotify. They stream white noise to their computer or their phone all night long and leave it on their nightstand table. White noise and pink noise are actually some of our most popular tracks on Spotify. And I'm not joking. We're available in 58 countries today uh, and growing. We add over 20,000 new tracks uh, into our corpus every day and have forever. The real number is goes lower, it goes lower or higher, but it's always over 20,000. We have over 2 billion, we just published this number yesterday, actually, 2 billion user-generated playlists. Now, it's important. I'm distinguishing between user-generated, which means the playlists that you all create when you use Spotify. I'm differentiating between that and the ones we create. If, you know, if you've heard of Discover Weekly, that's a playlist we create for every active user. That's like 75 million playlists that we create. That's not part of this number. This is the ones that people sit down, drag tracks in, and make a playlist. So it's a lot of data for a lot of users. If you know anything, does anybody know anything about the music business at all? Like anybody working in like kind of related to the music business? OK. If from the outside, the music business seems very simple, or at least not that complicated. When you are trying to license music in 58 countries, the music business is insanely comp complicated. When you, in Germany, click a track in Spotify to play, which track you are actually served is actually determined a lot by complicated business rules. Because, for example, 
When we uh, license Justin Bieber in Germany, we license it separately than when we license Justin Bieber in the USA. There is a German version of his label that licenses his music in Germany, and they negotiate differently than the US version of his label, the Canadian version, the Australian version. Every time we go into a new country, we have to re-license this music. You also hear you have GEMA, right, the Music Publishing Society. Their rules are different than BMI and ASCAP and uh, the publishing rights societies in every other country. So when you click that track, not only which track are you allowed to play based on your account in which country you're in, does that, is that different for every user, but then who we pay and how much we pay them is different for every track and every user. So the business rules around this are actually really, really scarily complex. But the, our, our systems have to handle it. We also, as you're probably aware, if you know anything around this space, we have lots of competition. We have smaller competitors who could be, usually we, when we talk about that, we think about people being much more nimble than we are, like not weighed down by our heavyweight processes. But we're also literally competing with two of the biggest companies in the universe, Apple and Google. These are our competitors. This is important, and if you notice something up here, this is how competitive this market's getting. One of these competitors array is gone yes, last week, and now one of the other ones has gotten bigger, right? This is a very, very fast-moving, highly competitive market. So how do we support all these crazy requirements for our application while still like growing the service in real user numbers pretty significantly month to month? We are growing still incredibly fast. So we have to do, support that growth, we have to support these crazy rules, and we want to keep innovating at the same time, right? All these things are in conflict with each other, all these requirements. How do we do that? If you know anything about Spotify, one of the things we do, I'm not going to go, uh, go through our matrix and squads and tribes and that kind of stuff. That is a microservices uh, track. But what I'm going to tell you, like, the important part and how it relates to microservices is the core of what we do is this idea around autonomous teams. And for us, the dictionary definition of autonomous is interesting, but specifically this part of the dictionary definition of autonomous, we build these teams that are full control over what they do. Right? That's the most important part. The team has to be almost no dependencies on other teams. That's the most important part of how we get this stuff done and keep moving it forward, trying to be faster than everybody else. So I used to be, you know, before I came to Spotify, I worked at Adobe, and I built a product called Adobe Revel, which is probably no longer in the App Store, but it was until a few weeks ago, sadly. Um, but this is how we would build kind of connected applications, right? This is maybe how you build them. It's a pretty standard way of building connected applications. You have clients, probably a client team for each client type. You have a core library team that abstracts all the crazy business logic, probably uh, also handles all server communication to make that consistent. You have a server team. You have an infrastructure team. That's how we did it at Revel. That's how a lot of companies do it. Pretty obvious way to do that. The problem is, if you want to build a new feature in this kind of world, well, let's say you want to build a new client feature. The client team asks the core team, please give us an API that lets us do this. The core team asks the server team, please implement this on the server side so we can do whatever we need to do in the client. Possibly you're adding a new database type or something like that. Now the server team has to ask the infrastructure team. That's a lot of asking of other teams, right? That's a lot of people trying to get stuff onto other teams' backlogs. Let's say also, like, eventually the client teams get bored waiting for the server team. They're like, we know how to do REST, so we're going to just do it ourselves. OK, then they're talking to the server team. And then probably if there's some product person saying we have to launch this feature on all platforms simultaneously. Tons and tons of communication. The challenges around working this way are that synchronization part. It's trying to get everybody building the stuff so you can ship the feature. It's because the client implementation depends on the core implementation, depends on the Server implementation depends on the, on the infrastructure. So we don't want to do that. That slows you down. That slows you down 80, di 80 different ways. We didn't want that. So instead, what we did was we built full stack teams. Each of our teams has back end developers, front end developers, testers, UI designer, product owner, right? What that means is you want to add a feature to Spotify, you're on a feature team, you want to add a feature, 
You implement the UI, at the same time you implement the back end, the developers are sitting in the same room, a couple desks away from each other, they're in constant communication, it all goes out together, and it's a dialogue, it's not synchronization. So there's, a light, there's still light dependencies, can't erase all dependencies. Obviously, we're not, individual feature teams are not putting servers into racks in our DCs. Um, we're also, you know, uh, we actually, to work this way requires a lot of infrastructure support. And obviously, we're not submitting like 50 binaries to Apple or to Google. Like somebody has to package that all up and hand that off. But these dependencies are minimized to the ex greatest extent possible. So for us, again, at Spotify, for us that means there's 90 teams, over 90 squads, uh, with over 600 developers, the number's higher, this last published number, in five development offices on two continents, building the same product, right? Building the same app that runs on your phone, or on your tablet, or on your desktop, or in your PlayStation. So that's important to know, because this is actually one of the reasons why we come to microservices. Full, these full stack autonomous teams require us to build our th stuff in very loosely coupled architectures, right? So we don't have these dependencies. We have to build things in a way that there isn't strict dependencies between the components we build. Now, I'm going to take us back into a little bit of time. I'm not going to go as far back as as some of uh, the earlier speakers in the track, I'm just going to go back a little bit. And this is the way we built applications for a long time, connected applications. You're an app developer. You don't have a huge team. You build a server component, server trucks to a data store. That's the way we build connected applications. The application becomes more popular. Now, all of a sudden, your back end is starting to have some scaling problems. You identify, oh, it's the data store. Data store is slow. OK, so you shard it, uh, or you come up with some sort of a delayed replication system, whatever. We know how to solve that problem. Data, data store is slow. Let's, we'll fix that. Now you become more popular. Well, OK, now it's no longer your data store that's the problem. It's now your server. You have this big monolithic server implementation, and it's starting to get some of the code paths are getting slow. Well, OK, this is how we know how to solve that problem. We put a load balancer in front of it, create multiple instances. You know, this is, this is easy. We've done this for a long time. Now, Spotify is obsess obsessed with scaling. It has been obsessed since the beginning. It's been one of the things that's driven a lot of our architectural decisions from the first moment. So when we look at this problem, we've decomposed, we almost in, at the beginning decomposed it to this problem, right? Because if you're worried about scaling, to hundreds of millions of users, you build your system in a way that you can scale your components independently. And this has driven a lot of our direction with microservices. So when one part of your monolithic service was slow, you have to, re, you have to create new instances of big monolithic services running on very big iron and getting bigger all the time. So if I pick on Facebook, because I like to pick on Facebook around this, they're writing like a massively monolithic server, they are having to invent new computer science in order to distribute this binary around, right? They have people who ha make it easier for them to build this monolithic thing. We went a different way, okay? We said, we'll take on some different problems because we think those are easier to solve than actually hiring PhDs to make our binaries get distributed better. So when we see this problem, if this, let's say this white box is doing a lot of fan out to other services or is doing some heavyweight computation, we can just uh, duplicate that box or replicate that instances there and then not have to worry about all the other things that are actually running pretty efficiently. This is working for us incredibly well and it has for years. We've been working this way for years. So microservices, yay. Um, this part is the part that's super important really uh, easier to scale based on our real world bottlenecks. You can identify the bottlenecks in your services and replicate there or fix them there without having to do massive rewrites or actually come up with, uh, or actually having to do like uh, lots and lots of work to do that. Um, similarly, they're way easier to test, right? Because the test surface is way smaller on each one of these things. They don't do as much 
as a big monolithic application, so they're way easier to test. Developers can test them locally. That's awesome, right? To be able to test your service without having to deploy it to the test environment is super great, right? Especially if you're running a laptop, which many of the developers are. They're easier to deploy. They're smaller, right? That's super important for us. They're smaller. They deploy really fast. And they're easier to monitor. It's because they're doing less. So it's way easier to monitor each of those instances. They can be uh, versioned independently. This is something else we do a ton. So this is super important. As I said before, we run on embedded devices, right? Embedded devices manufacturers, when they want to create, like, they don't care. Once they've sold you your whatever, uh, in fact, this is the Wythings lamp that runs Spotify in it. Once Wythings has sold you this thing, they're really happy. They don't really care about you anymore because you're not going to rent the lamp from them. You own the lamp. You're not going to buy it again. So you're, that sale's done. They don't necessarily need to update it ever. Right? It's kind of like the Android phone problem. Right? Older uh, Android phones, there's not a lot of value in the carriers to update them. Right? Same problem in embedded devices. There's very little reason for them to update them which means that as long as these lamps are sitting on people's bedside table, they're going to be calling the same version of the API on the back end. They're going to expect it to work exactly the same. And if it doesn't work the same, the lamp is, going to start to, is no longer going to work. Now, the people who are going to be angry, the customers who have this lamp, they're not going to be angry at why things. They're going to be angry at Spotify, because they're probably paying a Spotify subscription. And they just expect their lamp to work with Spotify. So the cool thing about the way we work is when we do a new version of, a, of an API, we just create a new server. And we just run those separately, one instance per server. What that means is that to support this lamp, as long as this lamp is running, we'll have that version running in our data centers, uh, some, an instance talking to, uh, answering to that version, up until the point that the last of these lamps gets thrown away and then we can just shut down those machines. We don't have to have those code paths sitting in the new versions of the services. We don't add multi support for multiple versions into the same instances, which means we don't end up with nearly the kind of technical debt you end up when you, we used to do, like you'd add multiple versions to the, to the same binary, right? And then somebody, some point later, refactors some code that it turns out like a version 10, 10 versions ago was still using and breaks that. That's, I've seen that happen so many times. We don't deal with that. And that's super powerful and very valuable. Uh, the other thing that's kind of cool about the way we work and at the scale we're at is we're less susceptible with microservices to large failures, right? Big services fail big, small services fail small, right? This is important when you have an application like this. So if you start typing, this is my favorite service to kind of use as an example. If you start typing in Spotify in the search box after the third character, we start trying to suggest things to you, right? Guess what the name of that service is that gives you those suggestions? It's called Search Suggest. So what it does is it goes out and does some personalized, uh, personalized results for you based on your search history, based on the stuff in your collection, based on things you've listened to recently. So that one service is fanning out to like a bunch of other services. Any one of those fails, that's cool. You just don't see those results. If the search suggests uh, service itself fails, you type, you don't get anything until you hit return, and then you go through the other search service. So it works fine. Users may not even notice that. So at any point in time at Spotify, huge percentage of our, this doesn't happen, but it could happen. Large numbers of our services could be down in like all of our data centers simultaneously. And you, would, as a user, wouldn't know it, partially because it's 2015 and we built all of our things assuming that services can fail all the time. We've learned that lesson. But it's also because each of these services that could be failing is not doing so much that it not being there is going to ruin your experience with Spotify. So that's also pretty important. So there's the bad stuff about microservices as well. They're harder to monitor. And I, a couple of minutes ago, I said they're easier to monitor. I'm saying they're harder to monitor. Well, why are they harder to monitor? Because we don't have, because uh, we have thousands of instances running, right? We have a lot of little services running with lots of instances of them. So while the surface area on each one of these is smaller than like a big monolithic service, there's just way more of them. So that's a challenge for us. 
uh, discovery and documentation tools is super important. If you're a back-end developer starting at Spotify next week, you are awash in a sea of services that actually up until recently, there was no way to know what services actually there were. We were pretty bad about that, I have to admit. We've gotten way better at it. But even this next week, not all services are as well named as search suggest. Some of them are, these are services named by developers with no uh, ex expectation that people outside the company are gonna see them. So there's some pretty weirdly named services that have no context to what they actually do. That's okay. But if you're a new developer trying to figure out how to get album metadata, and there's no search that, uh, there's no service that's called album metadata returner, uh, which it might be if you wrote it in, and you were in Germany. Um, that was a joke, sorry. Bad joke on Germany. Uh, sorry. Uh, it, it's really hard. So we actually have had to put a lot of work into actually making it easier for people to find services and to get uh, documentation on them. This is uh, something that we call System Z. Uh, this is relatively new. It's only a few weeks old. Um, or it's been in development for a long time, but it's only really become super useful in the last few weeks. When you write a new service, and you check it into GitHub at uh, Spotify, you put a little YAML file in there, and then it populates this. So each one of these is, this is just some of the services, right? Um, like, for example, if you were a new developer, what does Keanu service do? You have no idea. Um, Hermes, Java, IB, Sim, okay, Bootcamp 42B. Uh, these are some of the services that are running. And, uh, you can click on these, you can get links to their GitHub repo, you can get uh, documentation on the service itself, the system owner, the squad owner, uh, monitoring for these services. So this is something we added relatively recently um, that's made it a lot easier. But up until this point, it was actually a little bit, it was pretty hard. You had to just walk through the code uh, in GitHub to find stuff. Another problem that we have uh, but everyone has. When you talk about what's wrong with microservices and why they're so horrible, uh, what you always talk or hear about is latency, right? Because what's happening is instead of us calling a single process or a multi-proc service that goes and collects all the data and returns it, instead we're calling lots of services and those services are calling other services and there's latency that grows through each one of these calls. So yeah, that's, that's horrible. The problem, the, the benefit that we've seen to actually working this way means that we've tried to figure out better ways to handle the latency. One of the things we did was we stole this idea actually from Netflix. This wasn't our idea. Where we switched to using these view aggregation services. So um, previously in uh, the Spotify client, like on your phone, it would make calls out to dozens of services. And, uh, and then kind of assemble all the data even some of it it didn't really need, and then it would kind of draw you a UI, which meant each one of these had their own latencies, and depending on the connection you were on, could be you know, good or bad. What we, did, what we did over like a year and a half, a couple years ago, is we switched to this other model, this view aggregation model. So it running in, we have other services that basically are one per platform per view, more or less, that go and do all this aggregation and return exactly only what the client needs. So it helps reduce the latency pretty significantly. Performance in the application took a pretty significant jump. Like the, the application has gotten incredibly more responsive by doing this. It doesn't mean we're not inducing latency by having multiple servers. It just means we're trying to keep the connections between them short, and so it's faster overall. We also decreased a lot of the traffic to the client. So this has worked quite well. Of course, if you're gonna write bad monoliths, you're gonna write bad microservices. I think one of the problems we have, because our services are owned by teams and lots of developers own lots of services, means there's fewer eyes on any part of the code pass. Uh, so if you are writing bad, crummy code, uh, yeah, you could actually, it, it's like bad smells can stay there longer just because there's fewer eyes on them because there's way more services. Although, honestly, they're all much smaller, so hopefully it isn't, it's a good trade-off, but it's something I want to acknowledge. Now again, so these are kind of generalized. Some of these benefits are benefits maybe you're already re realizing in your own companies if you're using microservices, um, but maybe at a different scale than we are, right? 
So if you're trying to convince your boss, like, oh, this is a really good way of working, and their boss says, well, nobody's ever really done this at scale, like, okay, well, we have over 800. These are the active services. We have another several hundred that aren't necessarily active. We have 810, based on a couple days ago, I just looked, 810 active services. That's about, uh, I saw the talk this morning, that's about this, I guess it's about the same as Netflix. Um, so we're doing this on a pretty big scale. Okay. That's about 10 systems per squad, right? So it's about 10 services per squad. About 1.7 per developer or tester or whomever. I didn't look to see what the roles were. I just looked to see who had LDAP access to production. So it's over almost two services per everyone who has the ability to touch a production service, whether they're testing it or coding against it or just happen to have access because they're in the right LDAP group. That's over for all of technology, for the entire technology department. That's 1.15-ish systems per member. So it's over one service per developer or tester or agile coach or manager in the technology group. That also means, by the way, um, that will, so that includes like everybody, that also client developers who don't write any server code. So that gives you kind of the scale we're talking about. Uh, Matthias Bjornhaden is talking tomorrow about uh, mobile development in the mobile track. So his squad, uh, his squad in Gothenburg has like 60 services that they run, uh, that they're responsible for, and that's with currently six backend developers. So that's the kind of way, that's the kind of scale we're at. This, for example, uh, is part of the metadata ingestion pipeline. So this is kind of the complicated, this is a squad owns this, this is six developers, six, seven developers. And these are their systems that they're responsible for. Um, I also wanted to, by the way, uh, we're pretty serious about open sourcing stuff. And uh, one thing we've done uh, pretty recently is open sourced uh, this technology uh, framework we call Apollo. So, uh, we've been doing this microservices thing for quite a while. Uh, a couple years ago, we started developing Apollo. Now, almost all of our microservices are built on the Apollo framework. It uh, does a tr makes things tremendously simple for us to generate new services. We decided that it was probably useful for everybody, not just us, so we've open sourced it. Um, it's on GitHub, please feel free, fork at will, and uh, put in pull requests, that'd be awesome. Um, we are probably open sourcing a lot, we've already open sourced a lot of other things, but we're talking about doing a lot more open source around this area, so maybe you'll be able to do System Z or some of the other things. Some of the stuff we had to pull out of here, like one of the things this does for us is when you launch your service, it does all the things to, we have a service called Nameless. Nameless does all the right DNS routing and stuff, so we get all that free versioning, routing, and all that kind of stuff. That might be something we'd uh, open source at some point later. And then Apollo, the, the, uh, our fork of it, actually does all that stuff for free, so it makes things pretty easy. So in retrospect, or to sum up, uh, we've been doing this microservices at Spotify for years. Uh, we do it at a pretty large scale. Um, we do it with thousands and thousands of running instances on, we're still running on our own DCs, we also do stuff in the cloud as well, but for our production environment right now is all our own DCs, more for historic rather than practical or uh, technical reasons. But we also run these services in our test environment which runs on AWS, um, so there's nothing inherently that would mean we couldn't do this as well in the cloud. Uh, we have been incredibly happy with it because we have scaled stuff up. We can rewrite our services at will, which we do, rather than continue to refactor them or uh, add more and more technical debt over time, we'll just rewrite them. So a lot of our services are on their fifth or sixth iteration. When we get to a scaling inflection point, right? so you're rewriting a service, it runs great on fi for 50 million users, and now you're at 60 million, and it's starting to, to be a little bit slow we'll go, okay, let's rewrite that. We know more now than we did when we wrote it. Let's make it work for 80 million or 100 million. 
because of what we've learned. So we'll do that, create a new version, direct new clients to that version. When the old clients stop, stop using the old one just because they've all upgraded, we kill that one, and then we go forward with this one. When we hit that limit, we've now learned more, and we'll rewrite it again. We do this kind of stuff all the time because it's really easy with this kind of architecture, and it's working incredibly well for us. So if you're, having a hard, if you're at you know, your company and you're trying to convince somebody, like, oh, no, no, this is, this is really great, and they're like, well, no, it's really too, that's a horrible idea. You can point to us, you can point to Netflix, you can point to a lot of other companies and say, this is really working for them. They're super, super happy with it. Um, with that, I actually talked faster than I meant to. I'm ready to take questions. Um, and thank you. Uh, so oh, oh, sorry. One thing, too. Uh, yeah, I am also around. I'm not wearing a big uh, red sweater. But, um, and also, yeah, we're hiring, by the way. Um, so uh, uh, if for whatever reason, though, you don't get a hold of me today, you can also pop me questions on Twitter. OK, sorry. so uh, thanks for your talk. Um, you. There are some, some questions in the online system. One is, are your teams not siloed by being autonomous? Uh, how do you make sure teams are, are not repeating what others are doing? rather than reusing? Yeah. So um, there is, uh, our, I would actually say our teams are kind of purposefully a little bit siloed, right? We, they're autonomous and they own a mission. The way we avoid uh, two teams trying to end up doing the same thing is we're pretty clear when we create a team, we give it a mission that does not overlap with anybody else's mission, right? So there's really no reason why the search team should be rewriting test infrastructure. They may write their own test infrastructure, but they're not going to redefine test infrastructure for the company. It's just not part of their mission. So we're pretty clear when we create a new team, like what they do and what they're responsible for. And then we make sure no other team in the company has that same or overlapping mission. So that's one way we avoid it. But actually, to avoid kind of multiple teams uh, not learning what other teams are learning, to make sure we do that, we have this thing called guilds. So guilds at Spotify transcend the entire company, and anyone can create one. So we have a back-end developer guild, a Java developer guild, a C++ developer guild, and then also stuff like a craft brewers guild and a photography guild. These are things that kind of bring developers in multiple teams together to talk about technology. And that's where we make sure like best practices uh, and knowledge get spread throughout the whole organization so that we don't ever end up with two teams kind of building similar technology to support their missions. OK. Uh, another one is, um, how do you handle the deployment of all your microservices? How do we handle the deployment? Getting how do we handle the deployment for our microservices? So we have, uh, so developers deploy themselves. So that should be some, I should, something I should also say. We actually used to have an operations team that handled deployments and incidents. We stopped doing that a while ago. Developers, teams are now responsible for their own operations, uh, which means also that we built these really nice tools to help them do the deployment. Developers deploy themselves whenever they want to. Um, and so what happens is there's a tool that, I love this name of this tool, there's a tool called the provisioning cannon. And it's basically kind of a one button thing that is like and shoot uh, instances of your service out to all the DCs and create and provision all them on running on our boxes. So we made really good tools to make it easy for developers to monitor, to respond to incidents, and to uh, provision, and provision and deploy themselves. OK. Um, so another one is, how do you handle authorization authentication across all front-end services if a desktop client talks with so many services? So one thing I didn't talk about in our architecture, but uh, I probably could have or should have, is all all client communication goes through what we call access points. So that's where we do all the security checks. Once you're there, the access point will send you out to whatever calls you want to make. So we have a, rather than, uh, we didn't want to create kind of a security nightmare where each service was having to do lots and lots of authentication on the client. So we do that through kind of these really lightweight access points that redirect you to the, to the service you're trying to get to. But they handle all the authentication. Okay. Um, how do you handle multiple versions with branches? 
Yeah, so what we'll do, so if you want to branch, say you wanted to make a new version of the service that had a new uh, API version, what you do is you just fork it and then create a whole new service from that and just rewrite. Um, usually the services are small enough. There's any kind of reusable codes are ready in a library anyway. Um, but for the most part, yeah, it's, it's pretty lightweight. We make it, that, well, these are all small services, it's pretty easy to just rewrite a new one. I think some, we have some fairly older, bigger services, but that's pretty rare. Okay. Do you run integration tests with uh, several services, and how do you deal with the different versions then? So one thing I think we should be better about than we are, if I'm gonna be totally honest, um, we do a lots and lots of really good unit testing on a single service. We do not do great integration testing across multiple services beyond lots and lots and lots of client automation. So we will run multiple clients. We run them with tons and tons of automation on them. And that is kind of a proxy for doing good uh, integration. But I think that's something we actually need to be better about, if I was going to be honest. OK. Um, and what about, so, so someone asked about uh, performance testing with uh, so many users. How do you deal with that? So, that, so one thing that's, uh, that's important about Spotify is we collect ridiculous amounts of data around uh, how users are interacting with the application. Probably way, way too much, actually, data. All anonymized. Um, I got to be clear. Tons and tons of anonymized user data. But that includes like a lot of stuff around performance. So we're always looking at uh, inner service performance. We're looking at client performance. Uh, there's teams that are 100% focused on that stuff. And then we're looking at how people you interact with it. So we're collecting lots and lots of real-time data and then analyzing it, uh, always. Uh, so do you have automated tests is another question. Do we have, sorry? O automated tests? Yes, we have lots and lots of automated tests. Uh, I thought so, okay. Yeah. Um, what about, uh, can you imagine working this way with developers uh, outsource sitting uh, in India? Um, could I imagine working this way with developers outsourced in India? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see particularly why that would be a problem. Um, the only thing I would say is uh, one thing that has to be, I think one thing that's kind of important, especially if you're having your own teams be responsible for operational responsibility, I think it works pretty well. Because if you write crummy code and you get woken up every night because you're having incidents, you fix that crummy code. So I think that's actually kind of an important part of this. If you had some other team either doing operations or they were doing the coding and you were doing the operations, there's that, you don't feel the pain. Um, but I don't see a particular reason why. Like we do this between our offices in uh, New York, Stockholm, Gothenburg, and Boston and stuff, and that works fine. So remote teams works okay. Outsource okay. teams I, uh, okay. should be okay. Um, so another question is, Apollo seems to be Java-based, and you say all services are based on it. Isn't that a little bit odd in a microservices world where you could use different languages? So we use different languages outside of production. So there's a reason we use Java in production. And this was, uh, we didn't used to actually make a rule around what language you use. That's actually relatively new. So most of the services that Spotify runs on, most of the older versions, Spotify was actually mostly written in Python, the earlier versions. And we started transitioning to Java over, the, over years. Uh, a little while ago, we noticed that the services that were having incidents consistently were the services that were still written in Python. So we more or less said, OK, from now on, we're only writing production, inst production services in Java. There's a couple reasons for it. One is actually developers move from team to team, and developers are code reviewing between teams all the time. And if every team is writing in different languages, that becomes incredibly complicated. That's, I think, probably the main reason we do. Also, because we are, like many companies, like when we find a tech th something that seems to work really well, we say, this is what we're going to use now, because we don't want to deal with the pain of stuff not working. Um, so that's the other reason. We know Java works, and now that all the production uh, code is written in Java, all the production services are written in Java, 
that makes it really easy for other people to jump in and help with stuff. Behind the scenes, we write in zillions of languages, right? So we're, our data pipelines are written, some, we're using Scalding, we're, so we're using Scala, we're using Erlang, we're using lots and lots of different languages at Spotify to write our services. We're just not using those languages in production. Okay, um, continuing the, the, the discussion around programming. So someone asked uh, whether you're using Go, the programming language Go. We are, but not in production. Okay. Um, do you have a bootstrapping tool per language for a service? No, so that's the other thing. Um, teams can more or less, again, like we, this is, it was interesting when we made this rule. By the time we made the rule about Java, every, almost every team was already in Java, so it wasn't a big deal, but for us to dictate a language was actually kind of a big deal for Spotify. Um, it's not usually the way we work, uh, but what we have done for all those other things like data pipelines and stuff, one of the things we've done is we've said, we're gonna make it super, super easy to do the thing we think is probably the best way to do it. We're not, if you wanna do it, something else, you're totally willing to do that. We're just not gonna invest a lot in our infrastructure to make that easy. So for example, the, the thing I showed uh, uh, Apollo is Java, right? Because that's what we use to do this. Um, we have other tools for Python. We have lots of Python stuff or that kind of thing. But no, if you're, we make it really easy to do Java. And if you want to do something else, that's fine. But then you have to do the work yourself. Okay. Um, another question around the, the architecture. Do you have a separate view aggregate for each device and each app? Yes. Okay. So each view is going to have its own, uh, each view per platform. So that, yeah. that was an easy one. Yeah. Um, how do you keep the teams in sync, uh, in, especially if one team depends on another one? Um, shouldn't there be like an architect for doing these kinds of global coordinations? So we don't, that's the point I think is the teams are autonomous, so we don't really keep them in sync. They do, each of them is doing their own thing on their own schedule and on their own pace. So we actually, and part of that is, we have nearly some, but as few as possible dependencies. So there is a lot of the work that we've done to set up our organization is to reduce the amount that teams have to synchronize between each other okay. and dependencies between them. So I think and microservices actually is super helpful for that. Okay, um, I, there is another one that, that I think is quite interesting. Um, so how would you migrate away from a monolith? Because, I mean, that seems to be what everybody is doing, but you haven't spoken about it, I think. Yeah, I think uh, I've been, I, when I talk to other companies, like when I go and visit other companies, um, a lot of them tell me, well, that's really great for you, but you kind of more or less started that way. And we have this really important system that's really old, and um, we, it's massive, and there's no way we can switch to microservices because everything depends on this thing. And it's, I mean, it's, I would love to say, well, I'm not, I'm not a consultant, so I don't go around and like make help other companies do this. I just have like my own opinion about it, which may or may not be right. Um, but the way I would look at this is every time I've talked to these companies, it's like, what is this big system doing? Well, it's doing A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, well, that's one, two, three, four, five different microservices you could have. Maybe you can pull this functionality out then you can pull this functionality out. It's just decomposing. I mean, I don't have a magic bullet for that, but okay. I've, I hear this all the time, and to me, when you're, it's easy for me because I'm outside it, obviously, like I'm not in your company, and I don't have to deal with all the, the uh, finance people or whatever, but what I'll tell you is, if you can step back a little bit, really kind of look at your system like a black box and just think about what it does, you can start to figure out what you can tease out and then sort of tease each of those th threads out. And that seems to be a, a good pattern I've seen work in other companies. Okay, so uh, continuing the, the discussion about autonomy, how do you balance uh, team autonomy with requirements that each service must do, such as monitoring, service discovery, health checks, locking, correlation IDs? So uh, there's very little that a service must do. Um, but again, that's also kind of assuming developers don't care about the services they write, which is silly. Of course they care about it and they want them to, to go, be good. So you know, nobody's saying you have to monitor your service. There's no 
rule, if you don't monitor your service, LBB, everyone will say like, hey, why aren't you monitoring your service? That seems stupid. Um, but any developer who knows what they're doing, like, and we hire people who know what they're doing, like, says like, we should monitor your service. We give you lots of tools to make it super easy to do that. If you don't do it, it's kind of, the question is why aren't you? Um, so we, they have a lot of choices on how they do stuff. We don't tell them, we, don't, we dictate almost nothing. But we make it super easy to do it in the easy way. And so why do you need to innovate on deploying services? That's not really something you as a developer writing services need to care about. If you have a really easy way to deploy your service, you'll just use it, because that's easier. And you can spend more time actually coding. So that's kind of, we don't enforce rules. We kind of make it easy to do the, the, uh, the smart thing and then make it a little bit painful to not do this, the obvious thing. But no one tells developers you have to do this, you have to do that. Okay. Um, With the exception of Java and production. Okay. So one rule we have. Um, there is another more detailed question. So how do you do uh, distributed request tracing, request tracing across all services? Uh, I do not have a. I do not have the answer to that question off the top of my head. I'm a VP. I'm not a developer, so okay. I have to apologize for that. I wrote, so that's kind of. I I wasn't. I ended up in this track in an in an unusual way. Let's just say that. So. <laughs> yeah, it was my fault. <laughs> so we do that. I don't know what we're doing about it. So how do you do code reviews across teams? Oh, so that's so. Um, so the way we do both code reviews actually in on call. Um, so if you know anything about Spotify, uh, which you may or may not, we have a matrix organization, which means like the teams being the vertical, these full stack autonomous teams are the vertical. On the horizontal is uh, sort of uh, what we call chapters. And then the chapter would be all the back end engineers across multiple teams. So for example, the way we would do code reviews is the folks in your chapter who may be in your team or they might be in another team that's part of your organization, they do code review, you all do code reviews for each other. If for some reason somebody in your chapter can't do it, there's the guild and you can ask somebody in the guild. All the back end engineers are in the same guild. So you, there's pretty easy ways to ask for code reviews. We actually require two code reviews of every check-in. Uh, you have to get two plus ones. Uh, to actually uh, merge your pull request. That's something that we've done forever and ever. Um, and it's worked really, really well for us. Um, so on-call kind of works the same. On-call rotations usually in the chapter. So you are not on call for all 10 of your services every night of the year. Uh, you have a chapter that usually is like seven or eight people. And because you're all code reviewing each other's code and because all your services are actually quite small, you can cover each other's systems pretty well. Okay, I guess, um, final question. Um, yeah. What is your biggest area of technical debt? Our biggest area of technical debt? Um, hmm. In the entire company or in, uh, in the back end, I guess? I think we have, uh, we, ha we have, all right, I think there's one service in particular. Um, if you know Swedish, it's a service we call Slusk, which is, uh, Swedish for trash. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's a service that kind of looks like a key value store. And it's kind of generic, which meant that it was a service where if you needed something to be in a kind of a persistent key value store, you just add it to there for years now. And um, so it's basically this kind of mess uh, data repository that owns way too many important things just because it was easier to throw something in there than to make a new key value store, yeah. So that's probably our number one kind of technical debt piece. Okay, thanks a lot uh, okay. for the talk. Thanks for Thank answering you. the questions. Oh.